major SOB, so that may be mine. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just make sure this stays tightly screwed down. That way you won't get all the rumble. I'm, I closed the door over there only because it's, it's hard. I mean, I can't see my own slides with a glare from the door. If people have to leave or come in late, it doesn't bother me. It's your course. <coughs> uh, mammary gland from a sheep. Uh, to me, when I first saw it, everybody was culturing it and, and having a good time. And I said, what are you culturing it for? And they said, well, it looks like a Clinobacterium mastitis. I said, well, remember, this is a, excuse me, not a sheep, a goat. I said, this is a goat and all that nice necrosis in the middle and all that fibrosis around the edge and oftentimes associated with uh, mineralization. This is a squamous cell carcinoma, uh, fairly common in uh, the mammary glands of goats, uh, sometimes seen multiply and uh, almost like the, the squamous cell carcinoma of chickens that I'm sure they discussed when you're talking about uh, um, in, in the avian section. Uh, here we are for sure in the reproductive section. And again, make sure you can count structures. There's an ovary here, and there's an ovary here, and two horns, and a big lump. And it's a very common manifestation of uh, lyomyosarcomas, as I see them. And in cut section, they're extremely characteristic. Uh, they look just like uh, a subgrowth picture of your histology of uh, lyomyo, uh, not lyomyosarcoma. I've never seen one uh, in a cow metastasized, but I'm sure it could. Uh, lyomyoma, just very, very large lyomyoma. This is one I remember when I was, could you lower the lights a little bit more, please? Uh, when I was taking the same exercise that you were doing, Dr. Thompson said, you should be able to diagnose this one just by looking at it. And I said, geez, he's pretty good. Well, if you've seen these before, there, there's nothing else that's like them. This is lung of a cow, and we're looking at these very characteristically, often polyhedral, uh, multifocal distribution, firm lesions, and uh, very yellow, but increased connective tissue around it. And this is a uterine adenocarcinoma. They're very, very common in old cows, uh, but they just don't come into the necropsy rooms. And they're usually disseminated. They commonly go to the, to the uh, lung, they go to the liver, they go to the draining lymph nodes of the uterus, and the lesion in the slaughterhouse is usually missed because it's usually very small. Here we are, this is the cervix over here, the uterine horns coming around, and this umbilicated lesion locally extensive increased vascula vascular uh, pattern on, on the surface. Can we lower the house lights just a titch? Because I think it does detra detract from the slides. Uh, if we can't, okay. And an ovary up here. But here it is, here's the umbilicated lesion. They're often very small. I've seen the massive, but easily uh, 11 out of 12 of them will be small like this. Very restricted in their growth. Very, very small primary lesions. And uh, some mineralization, some fibrosis here and uh, transmural uh, uterine adenocarcinoma, often uh, seen in old cows, that very characteristic appearance in the lung. Here it is in the liver, same type of tissue. Uh, it almost looks like the horn, horn as in the horn of a hoof, uh, as you see in squamous cell carcinomas, and we have some uh, biliary stones uh, st scattered in here as the, this, the biliary pathways have been obstructed. Oh, this is a, <coughs> excuse me, this is a, testicle from a bull. Again, uh, if you sample 100 bulls, you'll probably find this in five of them. And uh, these scattered areas of what appear to be inflammation, and indeed it is granulomatous inflammation. Multifocal coalescing uh, granulomatous orchitis. These are, I've never been able to culture anything out of them. Uh, I don't see gra gra by gram stain any organisms, and I presume that these must be traumatic events and some leakage of uh, spermatids into the interstitium and a reaction to it so that you've got sort of sperm granuloma uh, rather disseminated throughout the uh, uh, testicle. Uh, again, it's a common lesion, but doesn't cause any problems. Uh, this would be a kind of a fun slide to be thrown upon you. As you yeah, but the trick to these slides is always to orient yourself. And you say, well, wait a minute now. Here I am in the abdomen of a cow. Here's the mesentery. And you can see it. The, the, if you, you can separate the two folds of the mesentery. Here's the inside outside, and the outside is laying against what appears to be a calf in the middle of the abdomen. A lot of fibrin, so we have a f an acute fibrinopurulent uh, uh, par uh, peritonitis. You have the cotyledons exposed here, uh, and some placenta here, and we have rupture of the uterus. And he read the book, basically, if we ha have this orient, here's the, the vagin vagina here, and here's the pelvic portion of the vagina, the cervix about here, and it was sh it, he broke through the dorsal part of the vagina uh, and ultimately became 
uh, emphysematous. This animal had been partum for a long while. She ruptured her uterus. The baby was kicking around inside. It was contaminated through the cervix. And this is an emphysematous fetus now, but again, showing the, the uh, fiber and so forth on the surface. Uh, I guess after it's explained to you, it's always easy, but we never explain those to you when you're in the examination. <coughs> um, end of the penis in the bowl, fibropapillomas, we talked about them before, is another very common site, the genital openings, either in the, the vagina, and oftentimes they're what they call fibroids, uh, very, very large ulcerated lesions sticking out of the vagina of a cow. Uh, that could also be a squamous cell carcinoma, of course. And on the penis of the bull, they can be rounded like this, or sometimes they're uh, elongated and, and pedunculated even. Uh, testicle, I thought uh, the fellow was doing swine would probably show one of these because they're pretty common. Uh, this is a testicle out of a ram, however. And you'll notice the, he made the comment, if you see the radiating streaks coming out of it, and of course, if, also if you see the mediastinum testis, it's a dead giveaway. But uh, this is uh, obviously a testicle. And you have nice, obvious coagulative necrosis here. The outside is still viable. That's because there's another blood supply around the tunica. And uh, it's, it's uh, coagulative necrosis from uh, testicular torsion in a ram. Now, another ram testicle. And uh, they have the same basic lesion that we're talking about with the bull that you have the areas of granulomatous inflammation and some mineralization scattered throughout here. Here we also have some, ne some necrosis, and I'm wondering if uh, this was a t testicle that was became torsed, if that's such a word, and then uh, was not totally killed, and we've got some viable tissue left over in the middle, but there's coagulant necrosis in the middle, mineralization scattered all about, testicle of a ram. <coughs> in, a, in calves, I, I don't see this, again, uh, if you read literature, you'd think it's a pretty common lesion, but uh, if you look at 150, I look, commonly look at around 150 bulls in a day, uh, 20 or 30 times a year. And I've never seen this in, in bulls. But uh, in hospital uh, populations, I guess you have increased incidence. Here you can see the testicle. It's degenerate, so you have testicular degeneration. And you have an extremely widened area that would, come, would be the area of the epididymis. And obviously some, some abscesses. And this is uh, actin. Uh, <laughs> actinomyces, excuse me, in uh, epididymitis, and it commonly affects just the epididymis and doesn't extend into the testicle very much. Now, he says, he, after saying that, I'll say it's apparently right at the head of this, uh, this testicle, it did do this. this is, these are two separate testicles here. Both of them were affected in this animal, and it was just in the epididymis. He had no ampullitis. He had no seminal vesiculitis. He had no bulbourethral gland inflammation, uh, and that's commonly how I see them. Uh, and, it will go, and it did go up the sp uh, spermatic cord, so it did have a funiculitis as well. OK, this, no trick on this one. Uh, here we have the ovary and the fimbria is, it is adhered to it. And we have a dilate, several dilated saccules that correspond to your salping. So salpingitis, uh, maybe a hydrosalping. They really couldn't fight you on that one. But it is turbid. It's not clear fluid. Uh, salpingitis in cattle. Uh, when I culture them, I always get mycoplasma out of them, but sometimes I'll also get coronibacterium out of them. And you also have a paraovariitis, or parufritis. <coughs> um, cysts in the ovary in cattle are really common, and they're really easy to figure out. Uh, if they're greater than two and a half centimeters in size, uh, you're probably dealing with a cystic disease condition. So here we have a cyst in the ovary of a cow. And uh, you can see a little bit of lutein luteinization on the, on, the, on the surface. This is a follicular cyst. Most follicular cysts, if they persist for just a little while, well, for any time, really, they'll begin to luteinize. Uh, I have to say that, of course, if you read McEntee's textbook, he says that some granulosa cell tumors, when they develop in one large cyst, the pressure leads to almost total necrosis of the lining of granulosa cells in it, and you may get large ovarian cysts in dogs and horses, and sometimes he would say that about cattle, too. But this is a luteinizing follicular cyst. As opposed to this, another ovary, you can see the fimbria all over it, uh, nice thin wall of luteal tissue. Uh, there is no ovulation stigma, showing that it has ovulated. It's an anovulatory structure, and a nice luteal cyst. To be compared with one that has a stigma in the wall, it's just a cystic corpus luteum. And if you look at the size marker, it's two and a half centimeters. And 
family picture, if you like those kinds of things, put them all together. Uh, normal follicle, follicular cyst, cystic uh, corpus luteum, uh, 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 a luteinized, I think it's a luteinized follicular cyst, and a cystic corpus luteum right over there. Now, <coughs> they can get large. Everybody takes big pictures of, I've got one with my helmet on, an ovary of a, of a mare that I use when I teach. But this is a follicular uh, granulose cell tumor in the ovary of a cow, and they can get very, very large as well. They can be, have lots of cysts in them. Oops. They can have large cysts making up big fluid-filled areas, or they can be sort of solid. So you have some cysts in the solid, very typically uh, multi-lobulated bands of connective tissue going through it. Uh, they look a little bit more solid than the typical mare granulose cell tumor that you probably saw a couple days ago. Uh, but some of them look very cystic and just like uh, the mare ones. And to remind you, they can get pretty big. Uh, of course, a knife handle is six inches long. And uh, this is, it's common that I'll see four or five of these a day out of a thousand cows. <coughs> maybe not that big. Uh, maybe one, one of them would be that big. Uh, another tumor of uh, the ovary in the cow, the fecal cell tumor. I hadn't realized it, but uh, the vast majority of the ones that are in the literature are malignant uh, and bilateral. And this, we had a, I think it was a 14 or 15 year old Charolais that came in. She had been treated rather extensively for superovulation to, for, she was a valuable animal. And uh, I often wonder if hormones may have played a role in the pathogenesis of this neoplasm in that particular case. So here we have again, uterus and so forth, ovary right here, ovary right there, and then dilated salpings so and the oviduct going along. And this is hydrosalpinx, uh, obstructed. Uh, there was no inflammation in histologically, so I presume it was congenital. Uh, I don't know the age of this cow. You can have it in dogs, and you can have it in cows. Uh, you're in the uterus. There, oh, the ovary isn't included in this one. You usually have an ovary right around down here with a, with a CL in it. Chronic uh, pyometra in uh, cattle often is associated with a cystic hyperplasia. The blackening, of course, is just pseudomelanosis uh, because they're alive, but they can still have pseudomelanosis from the hydrogen, hydrogen sulfide uh, forming from various enterobacteriaceae and uh, iron from blood, so they get the blackening. Cystic hyperplasia. <coughs> um, placentitis is, is not that difficult to identify. If you remember, of course, that this area should be transparent. And of course, you have your, your uh, uh, cotyledons right here. <coughs> and this is a sheep. And there's a lot of mineralization, often a little white foci in all the, the protozoal and rickettsial forms of placentitis. And this is a form of Q fever, Coxiella burnetti. Um, these, the organisms that tend to fill up trophoblasts tend to make placentitis is, in cattle at least, much more severe. Uh, brucellosis is even worse than this, uh, but brucellosis and Q fever make nice placentitis just like this. But in sheep, they often have these little foci of mineralization in them if they have inflammation as well. It's not pus, it's usually mineralization. Uh, morphologic would be a fair one. They could say, you know, morphologic, and you'd have to say, oh my god. But keep your cool. You've got a testicle in the middle of it, and you have skin out here. What structure has got skin around it and a testicle in the middle? Uh, and it's got all this proliferation of tissue. Uh, mesothelioma, uh, of course, it's very common you, in your lab rat, in the laboratory animal section. They probably talked about it in the scrotum of uh, rats. And we find it commonly in the scrotum of bulls. And even unilaterally in the scrotum of bulls, they'll whack off one testicle. And doggone if the, the bull doesn't not have mesothelioma all over the place. Uh, I would never believe that having looked at some scrota, almost as bad as this, and they uh, took out one testicle and the mesothelium in, and the mesothelial tumor inside one testicle and it didn't go any further, suggesting that many of the in males it may come oftentimes from the scrotum. Uh, here we have a nice photograph, I think, of a persistent frenulum. frenulum. Here's the prefuse running down and here's the reflection of the, the prefusial fold on the penis. Uh, as you remember, if you, whoops, if you look at the, uh, the penis in a six-month-old calf, you can't extend it. And that's because this frenulum that wore off all along this raphe here, or raphe, R-A-P-H-E, uh, has not regressed. And here's a little tag of it left on this one I use for instructional purposes. 
but the urethral opening, and you can't reflect that thing back until it's a, te a testosterone-driven uh, necrobiosis, if you will, that allows the prefuse to be reflected off of it after the age of six months of age. So persistent frenulum and uh, a little bit of basic biology. <coughs> vagina of a cow. Uh, it could be a vagina of a dog. Uh, if it was a do of course, they probably talked about uh, prepubertal vaginitis in, uh, in uh, dogs, but very ca classic granular vaginitis, which in reality, these little uh, spots that show the highlights are areas of lymphoid hyperplasia scattered over the vagina. And uh, it can be rather serious. I've seen adhesions. I've seen vagina left where there was just a small opening left for urination. And this thing was zipped shut from severe uh, fibrosis and uh, third intention healing, if you will. And uh, just a, usually ureaplasm or mycoplasma, uh, vaginitis, granular vaginitis. Uh, pseudohermaphrodites or hermaphrodites. You can't tell until you get to the, uh, to the gonads. But here we have a polled goat. And it's, it's got a vagina with a rather prominent clitoris that looks a lot like the, uh, the end of a urethra of a ram. And as you take these out, you'll find any, any degree of uh, changes. Some of these, of course, you know, can get pregnant. Uh, like I was looking in the inquirer last week, uh, a guy, <laughs> well, you really, he, he, was a, he was a she and didn't know it, and he got pregnant accidentally. I thought that was an interesting word. They didn't go into it. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, uh, but really, get, look at the inquirer, inquirer last week. Some guy, I want to say he was, he was from Canada, and uh, he was a dock worker or something and got pregnant. Um, anyhow, the gonads here, look, even though it's in an animal that looks like a female uh, and has uh, XX uh, genotype, uh, it's got gonads that look a lot like testicles. And by Lord, they were testicles. And you can see running parallel to it, two sets of tubes running down through here. I'm o I opened the vagina. Uh, to the, uh, through, through the cervix and everything, but there are two sets of uh, tubes running down here. One was a mesonephric as well as a paramesonephric, and uh, you even have vestiges of the glands. And you open the, the gonads up. This is on another polled goat. And we have testicular tissue. It's degenerate, mediastinum and the testicular tissue, and cysts in the epididymis. And on, on the opposite side of that same goat, a different goat from the one I showed you, the gross photograph of the, of the vagina, and we have a cystic uh, a corpus luteum with some hemorrhage in the center, center of it. Had some testicular tissue here too, and some cysts inside the epididymal remnants. So hermaphrodites, you can always say if you've got both gonads there, and you can obviously make out testicular and ovarian tissue together. Uh, Pseudohermaphrodites, male or female, depending on whether the gonad is uh, testicle for male and ovarian for female. Uh, sort of unusual form of testicular, not unusual, the typical form, if it's, a, if it's not caused by trauma, is this form of testicular degeneration. And it sometimes throws people off because you see that white tissue in the middle of it, and we all kind of say it's sort of yellowish white, so it must be pus. But when you look at these really closely, there's mediastinum testis, it's degenerate, but it still has got some bulging here, so it's not s severely degenerate. And you look at those, and it's just a mineralization of those uh, individual seminiferous tubules. Cadmium toxicity, uh, gossypol can do this. Uh, but you've got to feed an awful lot of gossip pole to get it. <coughs> polled goat, they wouldn't tell you it's a polled goat, I guess, but uh, it is. And you see the little white areas up in the epididymis. The epididymis is, is in, excuse me, enlarged, uh, blind efferent tubules leading to sperm granulomas in the uh, testicles of a polled goat. And of course, finish off the, the male section and ruminants. We don't get a lot of tumors. Here's a degenerate testicle, mediastinum. You get some fibrosis here. And in the center of it, a yellow tumor that uh, has a nice capsule around it in this case and has some hemorrhage. And if it was in a dog, you'd call it an interstitial cell tumor. So why not call it an interstitial cell tumor in this bull? Uh, whenever they, they do this, they may have two or three morphologies that ask for. You have some peri periarchitis and at least some edema around the orc. And you also have a, uh, some varicosities here up in the, in the venous plexus. Uh, so there'd be a number of things you'd, you'd like to have to describe in something like that. Uh, in the older days, we would see this quite frequently. Uh, cattle, uh, this is the inside of the uterus. Here's the cervix over here, and you're going through the cervix. And even you, can't, you have a hard time telling where the cotyledons are. And that's because there's some large areas of granulomatous uh, metritis here, or endometritis. And this is TB. I've seen similar lesions more recently in horses, uh, granulomatous TB, 
uh, endometritis. So it's still around, but the organisms are a little bit different. It used to like to home in onto the testicle and the uterus quite frequently. Granulomatous inflammation. Here is a rather mild case of brucella and uh, placentitis. Again, it's not hard. A large area is where the uh, attachment is. This is indeed suppuration and exudative change, and lots of exudate in, in, in the intercotyledonary uh, areas of the, of the placenta. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the, the intracellular organisms, the ones that fill up the trophoblasts, like brucella, do, do that, but also more commonly, uh, now, because uh, Brucella is under control and because uh, TB isn't around, we get a lot of these very thickened leathery placenta, uh, the cotyledons, so forth, and this is a Morchiorella or a fungal uh, placentitis, chronic separative exudative placentitis. Uh, Brucella of the testicle, I, I haven't seen one in, in years from, from bulls, but this is one from a ram, and uh, often it's limited to the, either the head or the tail of the epididymis. And here's the testicles here. They're degenerate to a certain degree, but uh, severe granulomatous epididymitis in this particular animal. Uh, more commonly, particularly in young ram, if it was the young ram, you'd be associated with a, a, a histophilus instead of brucella, brucella. But you know, once they get out in the field, they'll pick up brucella, and the rams will all have brucella if it's in the area. Uh, so here we have a little bit of review here. We, had, we talked about fecal cell tumors. We talked about granulose cell tumors. Here's a, the ovary of a, a cow, CL in it. It has a nice yellow tumor, and that's just another granulosa cell tumor. I, luteomas uh, are rare squared. Uh, uh, I only saw one in my life, and that was in Dr. McEntee's collection. Uh, mammary gland from a goat, and uh, here's a septum between the two, normal tissue and a nice E. coli mastitis. Uh, coli, coli mastitis is, uh, is, a, is a biggie, particularly if you're in a place where you've, you've managed to control your strep mastitis. And uh, it looks like that. There's some edema. Uh, you can, of course, get some infarcts in them with time. Okay. I'm not going to get through all my stuff, so I thought I'd go through a couple systems uh, to make sure that you uh, see the ones that have easy morphologics that might be of use to you seeing in a quiz in the future. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention in the CNS system, of course, and some, I'm sure someone has seen this, but uh, tumors in the brain of cattle are pretty rare, and the only ones I've ever, not the only one, but uh, the only one I've got a good photograph of, I should say, is common, and that's lymphosarcoma. You can see it up in the brain, and here it is infiltrating the uh, meninges over the cerebellum of this cow, and uh, the rest of the brain is essentially normal. We, it's hard to see the thing grossly. You know, we go in, we have any cow that's got lymphosarcoma and she's, got, she's not ambulatory, and we hunt in the spinal cord, and it looks so much like fat. Uh, I can't, I mean, when you're looking for it and you can't see it, I really get disappointed, and we find it histologically, so it's even more disappointing. Uh, but it, in the spinal cord, in the brain of cattle, is fairly common if you look at the subpopulation of cows with uh, lymphosarcoma. Um, Okay, here we have a photograph, and you're in the chest. Here's the lung up here pulled off to the side, and here's the, the pericardial sac, and you have this in the middle of it. So the morphologic, of course, is hemothorax. And the first thing you do is you look for a bullet, at least where I come from. Someone took a pot shot at somebody's cow in the field, and we couldn't find any place in the body wall where it went through. And as you all know, I'm sure they mentioned to you, looking for where a bullet comes in is sometimes difficult. But if you're looking for it and you still can't find it, uh, you wonder where it came from. To have a large blood clot in a, in a viscous or in a, a body cavity means there was a rexus of some kind. A large blood vessel broke. And here's a large blood vessel that broke in this cow. Here's the body wall, uh, the heart wall. And right up in through here, right through the atrium, we had a, a rupture. And, uh, and I said, oh, shoot, that happens in pigs. And everybody's fighting me on this one. He's got low copper, but you know nobody likes it all. Because as you know, even though the literature tells you rupture of the aorta, uh, in those animals that experimentally have uh, hypo hypocuprosis, they also ruptured through the atrium right in this area. So it's kind of an interesting lesion. But then I found out that this was a breed of cow, and it's a limousine cow. And uh, limousine, of course, are the ones that have the Marfan-like syndrome described. And uh, there's a couple of bulls that throw calves. Even uh, Apparently it's a dominant or somehow an unusual penetrance because they can uh, be bred to a uh, Jersey cow and they can still uh, throw an affected calf. 
with, of course, a defect in fibrillin, just like in Marfan in man. So it's kind of an interesting case, a good jumping off point for discussions anyhow. Uh, lamb, uh, it's, it's a lamb <laughs> liver, and uh, very characteristic lesions. It asked for a morphologic and it asked for etiology, and you'd have to tell them what the etiology was. And you'd say, put it to the slide and write, Dr. Edwards, and I would. But uh, the, the thing to key on are these little target-like lesions scattered throughout. And this is an example of campylobacteriosis, uh, former, formerly, of course, vibriosis in lambs. Uh, newborns or fetuses born with uh, vibriosis. Multifocal, suppurative, sometimes coalescing, uh, and necrotizing hepatitis. But in most cases, you take a photograph and you have these little spots all over the place. Uh, there aren't a lot of viruses that do this in, in animals. Rift Valley fever can do this uh, in, in sheep, uh, and perhaps in calves, but uh, usually bacterial. Uh, Salmonella is a good bet. Um, you can take your bet, if they, your, your, your pick. If they're really large, you might want to think about mycotic as well. Multifocal, suppurative, sometimes coalescing. And often, of course, in, in sheep, you can see where this is coming in. Why would, it be why would this structure be commonly seen with a sort of a cluster of this suppuration? Because that's where the ductus venosus goes through. And this is usually a, the product of an umbilical infection. And it just rides right on up from the umbilicus right up here. So those surgeons cut those infected umbilicus, umbilici, no, it's umbil umbilicuses off. And they, they have not cured it because that was just the portal of entry. And it came down and will infect. And you'll often find abscesses at the point where the falciform ligament uh, connects. Liver in a cow. There's a couple of morphologics, of course. You have an orange liver, which would mean, most people say keratinosis, or it could mean chronic fatty liver. But then you have all these little foci. And they almost look like they're proliferative, don't they? Well, if you have a little bit of postmortem change with this disease, it, uh, it looks like this. But if you have a fresh specimen, they look like this. In nice areas of coagulative necrosis, multifocal, scattered, both, lobs, uh, both uh, lobes of the liver. Uh, you'll see them in a slaughterhouse, you'll, and if you get them fresh, they look like this. But if you get them in a slaughterhouse, in the in necropsy room, or if it's a field necropsy, they'll look more like this. And people always miss this for some kind of a proliferative lesion, a granulomatous inflammatory lesion or a tumor. And, uh, and these are just necrobacillosis. Necro, fusobacterium necroforum, a product of a toxic rheumatitis or some, other, some kind of lesion leading to uh, rupture of uh, the epithelial integrity and seeding of the liver with these organisms. They also say, of course, that foot rot can lead to this. Here's a neat one. Uh, I, I think this thing should be somewhat educational as well, because I see things and I, I, maybe someone will have some ideas for me. Uh, here's a liver in a cow and a rather locally extensive and severe lesion that looks sort of proliferative. And on cut section, you have a lesion that looks like this. And I can say, well, Lord, why not chronic fasciolysis? It doesn't look like it. But it looks like you, you almost look down vessels there. And this is uh, hepatic vasculosis uh, of cattle. It's described in literature. Some people have decided to call it hemangiosarcoma. I've seen hemangiosarcoma in cattle, certainly much less frequent than this lesion. And it doesn't look like anything like this lesion. The lesion is prominent, uh, fibrosis, uh, a little bit of bile duct proliferation, but lots of muscular arterioles scattered through here. And at the advancing edge, it'll actually go through like it's invading through the portal areas. And you'll get widening. Uh, lots of, these are all vessels. These are not uh, bile ducts. These are all vessels. Some of them are, you can see the muscular wall to them. Um, bile duct in the middle of it right there. Uh, hepatic vasculosis. And it makes a really nice lesion. And uh, it's, it's nice. And it's also kind of different. Uh, if, you, if you've got any ideas on what some people want to call it a tumor, I can't because it just stays so localized. And it's just a fibrosis and sort of like vessels going off on their own. But it doesn't look like a hemangiosarcoma at all. Um, liver, you know, necrotic liver is kind of a, an art form. Uh, at least in cattle or in any animal species, if you have massive, severe necrosis, it kind of turns red like this. And if you have some fattiness, this is the more viable area of liver over here. And this is massive, or submassive, or lobular, if you will, multifocal, acute uh, toxic hepatitis, we used to call it. But that's not a good morphologic, uh, because it's just necrosis, uh, hepatic necrosis. And there aren't a lot of toxins that do this. Massive doses, massive doses of certain plants, massive uh, doses of crotillaria and sinicea will do this, certain species of crotillaria. Uh, 
But uh, this is the kind of liver that would give you a photosensitization too. So if you think that, matter of fact, this came from a sheep with photosensitization, fo a facial e eczema, and uh, uh, this is uh, toxin necrosis. So if you thought that they're all going to have the fibrotic liver with uh, nodules of macro regeneration, uh, you're wrong. I like this slide. It, it, it kind of points out a lot like the fusobacterium lesion, a locally extensive and severe area of hepatic necrosis. Uh, one might, I might not, but one might call it an infarct. It's described as an infarct by certain people. Uh, the liver is a hard organ to get an infarct in, and I, would, and I always have wondered, well, if it's an infarct, why do you have these areas in the center that aren't infarcted? Uh, particularly when you know what causes it. And this is a case of, sure, basilar hemoglobinemia, hemoglobinuria, and uh, clostridium, and uh, locally extensive area of coagulum necrosis and hemorrhage at the edge. Again, in the center, the hemorrhage doesn't get there because there's no way for the blood to get in there. And there's no, there's, there's not, like, just like with fusobacterium, it's all coagulum necrosis because it's necrosis because of the, the really severe toxins produced by the bacterium. And there are no neutrophils in here. All you find is sinusoids, histologically, sinusoids uh, with no inflammation at all. And uh, it's just washed out because of the lethocinases, I presume, that would be cutting up the uh, cell membranes. It's also a fatty liver. Uh, a little bit of postmortem change. This area will rot, and this area will stick out and still be firm because it autolyzes much slower than the rest of the liver. A common lesion, if you're doing uh, calves, uh, right here along the fold in the liver, where the, uh, you know, when you form the liver, there's a fold in the meso. I'm not sure what it's called at that stage in the, in the, in the uh, embryo. But before the liver turns, it has a big extra fold of mesentery on it. And sometimes it remains as a remnant on calf livers. It must go away because I've never, ever seen it in an adult cow uh, or bull. Uh, it's just like uh, lymphatic cysts in the, in the valves of cattle. They go away. But uh, here's a nice example of a uh, capsular mesenteric cyst on the calf. Very common, of no significance. Sometimes you'll find little coagulum. Uh, developmental cysts is what uh, the fellow who was talking about pigs called his. Uh, you'll find little coagula in it periodically. Liver. Now this is obviously, uh, uh, the blue is, of course, because it was condemned at the slaughterhouse. Uh, but here we have massive uh, hepatocellular necrosis with nodular regeneration and fibrosis. Some people would call it cirrhosis. I don't fight about it now. Uh, and on cut section, uh, there, are, there are different schools in what that might be called. But on cut section, large areas of fibrosis, islands of pigment and cell debris, and this is chronic fasciolysis, uh, bile duct fibrosis. Uh, again, this is a massive hepatocellular necrosis, bile duct fibrosis, bile duct proliferation, and macronodular regeneration, along with islands of uh, pigment. This is a good one for, I would think, be a good thing to think about is you're looking, I hope you all can recognize it, you're in the chest and anterior abdomen of a cow, and here's the lung up here, there's some extra fluid up here, and there's a massive liver. Even though it's a big bull, it's still a massive liver. Very, very blue, and you can see with the highlights, it's not a very smooth surface. And then you see this great big lump here. And uh, I mean, when the cow walked in before we put it down, we knew what the diagnosis was, and it's a good case of traumatic reticular pericarditis. However, uh, chronic passive congestion of the liver. So you'd want those two diagnoses. And of course, the third one on there would have been hydrothorax from the extra fluid in there. There's some edema, the gallbladder down here. There's just a whole slew of things you can. So don't panic if someone were to ask you for four or five math morphologics. It may be something as simple as hemorrhage. But if it's there, put it in. They can't take it away from you. Uh, but of course, they would want you to notice this great big pericardial sac and the fact that it's pushing the lung up and this big, that big liver. They'd want you to have those two morphologics at least. And typically, a chronic passive congestion liver looks sort of blue, very, very dark. Uh, you'll see bands right through the capsular surface where you might have some fibrosis if it's chronic passive congestion, really chronic. Uh, but if it's acute passive congestion, the typical nutmeg pattern of central lobular congestion and peripheral lobular, sometimes mild lipidosis and he hepatocellular swelling, uh, nutmeg liver from chronic passive central lobular congestion. And that's, a, that's what a nutmeg looks like, if you ever wondered. Nos mascada. Um, <clears throat> here's a chronic passive congestion that's also gotten to the point where you could, where I would call it hepatic cirrhosis, uh, bands of fibrosis. You can almost see the pseudolobulation going on here at the subgross level, 
of chronic passive congestion. You have a little bit of nutmeg pattern right in there. Chronic passive congestion, hepatic cirrhosis. In sheep, uh, once you get west of the Pecos River and up into Colorado, northern New Mexico, uh, you find long uh, lance-shaped flukes inside the bile ducts, the, the fringe tapeworm, uh, excuse me, the fringe tapeworm, <laughs> and if you extend them out, uh, they don't cause a lot of fibrosis or even reaction in the tissue, but the livers are condemned from the fringe tapeworm. They, need, they, they have to have a sosid, uh, sort of like a sand mite or a, a, a book mite that is the intermediate host for this uh, parasite. So we only find them in certain areas. I see this a lot, and I'm hoping that someone might come up to me after me and say, yeah, we see a lot of this too. Uh, here we have an orange liver. Orange livers, if you ask anybody, they usually say, well, that's keratinosis. Uh, but I can't find the parent literature on that to be able to find out how they ever documented that. However, it's a swollen liver, and it's got all these little white flecks through it. I hope you can see that. Uh, I can see them real good from right, right up here. And if I go a little uh, to another slide, those things can be as large as this. And this is a real diagnostic challenge because most people miss these because they don't know e they're not even in the book. They're not described in the book. But I see them with some frequency in uh, the slaughterhouse looking at hundreds of livers. And uh, these are nodules of lipogranulomatosis. And that other one, I should have put this one second, showing all those little nodules of fat accumulation uh, through, the, through the liver and an orange liver. And histologically, if you, since you probably never have seen them, uh, here are some of these nodules, one right there, one there, another one here, and therefore, and higher magnification. You can see that there's a nice granulomatous response around those. Macrophages full of fat, as, uh, as attested to by the, the vacuoles there. And these are late little fatty granulomas, and I see them, again, I see them with some frequency in cattle. Most common, in the north anyhow, the most common liver lesion in, in cattle is, of course, these lesions that are they're umbilicated here, they're depressed because they're areas where hepatocellular tissue isn't. And on cut section, again, they're somewhat umbilicated, depressed, and they're often full of blood, and uh, this is telangiectasia, uh, multifocal coalescing areas of telangiectasia, if you will. Uh, very commonly, very common lesion in livers around the United States. <coughs> in the mesentery of cattle, you probably saw it in uh, the wildlife section. They probably showed you, because this might actually have been from a deer, uh, uh, the tenia, uh, hydatogena, inside the mesentery. Let's say it's a sheep. I'm not sure at this point. It must be a sheep because this is a, my sheep slaughterhouse background. Uh, very, very common. And interestingly enough, just like in, in rats, if you had a heavy manifestation of these things, that's a model in rats for a, 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 a pseudo-neoplastic model. And it does cause gastric, uh, like adenomatous uh, polyp proliferation when you have really severe ma uh, infestations of these in sheep. But no one ever, I guess it's not something really, wor really well worked up. Very commonly seen in the liver. And most liver lesions in sheep, if it's not caseous lymphadenitis, are old scars from these tenia lesions. And here's the scolex right there. And if you get it in the acute stage, uh, a wandering minstrel, if you will, he started here, and, we're, and this is the fibrosis. And this isn't old enough to get fibrosis, but if you take a section right through there, you'll find the worm. Migration pattern of the tenia, uh, hydatogena. Recently in Jabba, uh, Hellman and Adams and mm, Bailey, I think, uh, wrote a paper about a condition called uh, fatty fibrosis and lipidosis in, in livers of cattle. And if you'd never seen that, I thought I'd show it to you. It's thought to be rather unique to Texas and uh, out from about El Paso to San Angelo in Texas. Very geographically lo located. But this thing is yellow, and you literally can drive a nail with this. It really gets very, very hard. In the early stages, it begins with this rather unusual pattern of distribution. Now, this is a recovered one. Uh, this, when, it, when they get whatever the toxin is, we don't know what it is. And they spend a lot of time looking. I've been talking since the 30s. They've been looking, and they can't find it. Uh, it begins, these would reflect areas of, of uh, hepatocellular accumulation and necrosis, uh, fatty accum accumulation and, and necrosis. And then, uh, with time, those would form larger areas like this. Now, this is a recovered sheep, uh, sheep, sure, cow. And if you take the toxin away, they can regain all the weight that they lose, but it really sets them back. And uh, they get the classic, what they call boxing glove liver, and that's the boxing glove liver in a sheep. Uh, you all know from the 
flow differences, at least they say it's because of the way the flow of the liver is that you get these different distributions of toxins. Has anyone ever looked up those references? It's kind of neat. They go back to 1928, and uh, apparently it was between the splenic flow and colonic flow in dogs that they studied it. And the spleen goes to the right, and the colon goes to the left. And I had thought they were talking about the stomach versus the colon. But it's really, really kind of some interesting references. They injected dye into them, and they got pictures in the reference of the blue dye going to one side, or if you put it through the, uh, the, the splenic vein, uh, going to the other side. But at any rate, uh, that that's how they explain the difference, differential affectation of the liver inside these cattle. And those early lesions look like this. Now remember those other fatty, because she was over there thinking when, when he showed that photograph, well, wait a minute. He just showed me those little foci, and how do I know that those aren't the same thing? Notice that these don't have that vacuolization to them, these little islands. And it's a, a rather unusual kind of grainy material in there. And sometimes you find the, the, the uh, crystalloids in them, like you do with saponin infections, like with lechagia toxicities, and, or hemp. And uh, this is what it looks like in the early stages. And with time, they'll, they'll get big, and there'll be a little bit of bile-like proliferation, and they'll get, they get so they coalesce, and all, these little fo all the liver along the edge has got uh, those sort of funny hepatocytes in them. See so these kind of foamy uh, hepatocytes that are generating and are replaced by fibrosis and a little bit of bile duct proliferation. And ultimately, what's left in that hard end is mineralization, fibrosis, and old ceroid. And I've literally driven an eight-penny nail into a board, a pine board, but still drove, drove a board, uh, with a liver from one of these animals. Here's a, uh, remember, and the, li the, the lymph node that I showed you back, that was, I said was lipid granulomas, and I told you to keep your eye on, on that. That was the lymph node from uh, one of those uh, hard yellow liver livers. So read that review article, I think it came out in January in JAVMA. Kind of a cute little d disease. Uh, lymph, this is a hepatic, hepatic lymph node from a cow. And we're in 20th century America, so we don't think much about it. But this is worth $500 to a meat inspector. This is tuberculosis uh, from a cow in El Paso. Uh, we always, you know, when I was in New York, we blamed the Canadian cows. And we're in Texas, now we blame the Mexican cows. But uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, they certainly do have a bad problem with tuberculosis in Mexico. But uh, this is tuberculosis in the hepatic lymph node in a cow in El Paso, Texas. Multifocal and coalescing. Uh, granulomas hepatitis. In vet paths, uh, about a year ago now, uh, they described a condition that used to be called green liver. Uh, green liver disease is now called 2,8-dihydroxyxanthinosis or something. Uh, this is what that looks like. And to me, it reminds me an awful lot of the process. Histologically, it's got those same kind of foamy macrophy uh, hepatocytes in it. And I often wonder, now that's in Pennsylvania, mostly western Pennsylvania. I guess they get some in Michigan. But uh, it's got a rather s unusual distribution. I'd never seen it, I've never seen it in the necropsy, this, in the necropsy room when I was in the North Country. But that's what it looks like. And uh, guess what? The, this is the gastropathic lymph node from that. Uh, so I think they're probably different toxins, but they probably share a common pathogenesis. And they don't know what causes it either. And I've never analyzed the material inside the sheep, the, the, the cattle lesions that we get, although I plan to do that and uh, find out if it's a deposition of a similar compound. But this is the gastropathic lymph node from a green liver disease. And this, this was, d did happen to come from Pennsylvania. But I believe that they have had some cases described in Minnesota, too. But it's outlined in that article in Vet Path. Piece of cake, uh, pipe stem, if you will, liver, uh, fasciolysis. Uh, fasciolides, if it's got a lot of pigment. And uh, this one doesn't have it. But uh, fasciola hepatica otherwise. Large cross-sections of your bile ducts, uh, some fibrosis and bile duct hyperplasia, a lot of which they can reproduce experimentally just by giving proline. And they found that proline is uh, an active secretion from a lot of those uh, parasites. This is worth the price of admission, I think. Uh, periodically, we see it, but it's, it's rare. Uh, but I want to share it with you for its diagnostic significance. You look at a liver, comes down the line, it's got these little spots in it. And little clear, sort of opalescent or uh, gray lesions on the capsular surface. You get a little closer, and you look at it, and look at the little nits in the middle of them, little, little white foci scattered, one there, there, there. Each one of those little cysts has one. And on cut section, that's what they look like. Uh, it's before my time, even though I, you know, 60s, 
but we don't have a lot of real young histos uh, cystocercosis. But this is what the cystocercosis would look like. That would be the size and the appearance of what it would look like if you were to see it, let's say, in the heart of a cow or in the tongue of a cow or the diaphragm of a cow. So think of what that looks like and just put it someplace else, wherever you want. Uh, but this is uh, cyst uh, cy hepatosis cystocercosis. Uh, it's, I see it periodically, and it, for, for those of us who are, you know, got into pathology after the disappearance of the lesion, uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, you can't leave the liver and cattle without talking about uh, abscesses. Uh, troubles I had on my abscess pictures with, with sheep. So this is a sheep, uh, a cow liver with several abscesses that you can't see, but a, a liver abscess on cut section looks like an abscess. So that's not much of a diagnostic challenge. Uh, however, when you have one in the posterior mesenteric artery, uh, the, the hepatic vein, uh, I've always wondered, you know, look, it's just that short distance, and that's why, uh, you know, it's kind of hard to imagine why you might miss the lesion, but I've had uh, students miss the lesions who are right here because they cut the heart off and they never really looked throughout the, the posterior vena cava. Uh, but this thing will rupture and will seed the lung, and you might have a dead cow. Uh, it is episodic. It has to be episodic, I guess, to kill the animal because the animal will get sensitized on the first time around, and then it'll die the second time around. And if you don't believe me, when you look at these lesions, you'll find in the lungs of these cows both the chronic resolved abscesses and more acute areas of consolidation and multifocal, sometimes coalescing, uh, separative, separative pneumonia, not a bronchopneumonia pattern. But you'll find these little abscesses from the first episode, and then later on, you'll see the more acute areas uh, as well. And then this, and this one is the, isn't the one that ruptured and killed the animal. The one that ruptured and killed them uh, is still in a very acute stage, and you just see inside the vessels, little emboli of uh, bacteria and, and suppuration. Kind of neat. Uh, torsion of the, the lobe of a liver. This is a rare bird, but I, I use it as a jumping off point. Hopefully, you can see that there's a torsion here. And then the, the very prominent capsular vasculature, which occurs whenever you have these type of uh, accidents occurring with viscous, uh, viscous and or uh, parenchymal organs that can twist like this. But this was neat because it tores because it had two, uh, it had hepatocellular adenomas in it. And uh, this may be the only example you ever see, unless you see a lot of these maybe, of uh, a collision tumor. Uh, they are two tumors that came together and they didn't mix. And histologically, it was frustrating to me. I'd made a section like right through here, and I said to show the students why on one side it's not yellow or green, and the other side it's green. And histologically, I couldn't tell which side was which when I got the slides back. Uh, that's life. But and this is a hepatocellular adenoma. Uh, fairly common when you look at aged cows, large numbers of them. Pneumonias don't really turn me on, uh, and I apologize for that. But uh, you have to know about them. Uh, anterior and ventral. Bronchopneumonia, uh, severe with fibrinous pleuritis. Uh, this animal was killed because it had a broken leg, but it made a nice photograph, made a nice fresh photograph of the, of the lesion. A little bit of a fatty liver, but you wouldn't have to call that shot. Uh, enter a ventral bronchopneumonia. Pasturella, pasturella multacida is really common. Uh, you can culture a lot of different things out of them. When they start to get really severe fibrinous pleuritis to go along with it, I always start to wonder about whether or not there may be a mycoplasma working in it. And it's not a very often uh, recorded lesion uh, a description of mycoplasmosis. But when you have mycoplasma enter in there, you get the really classic marbling of the lung that uh, is also said to be due to pastorosis. Um, if you don't culture past, uh, for the mycoplasma, you're never going to culture it. If you just send a sample to the Bacti laboratory, they'll send you back all the aerobic uh, or facultative aerob aerobic bacteria that they can culture out of these things. And I really think that we're missing a lot of mycoplasma diagnoses. This did have pastorella multosida in it. I submitted it also for mycoplasma cultures, and it got one back. And of course, remember that uh, contagious bovine pleuropneumonia was eradicated, uh, but the lesions look, you know, if you're wondering, uh, you show, if, if they showed you that picture, make sure you suggest them that it may be contagious bovine pleuropneumonia particularly if you have an area of a sequestrum in the middle of it. Sequestra and severe marbling of the lung would be contagious bovine pleuropneumonia until otherwise proven. Uh, in juvenile and young bovine, uh, viral pneumonias, uh, the only one I ever see that really kills is this one. And this is a uh, uh, respiratory syncytial virus pneumonia. 
Uh, it's a severe, diffuse um, interstitial pneumonia, uh, oftentimes non-separative. And uh, this one also, he had, he had an umbilical infection, so there were little abscesses in it as well. But uh, he had all kinds of problems in him. Respiratory substitial virus. As I mentioned, this is a very young animal, and uh, he has these multiple full size scattered through it. When you see them throughout the lung, and they're white like this, and there's a very young animal, don't be afraid to think about mycotic. And this is indeed a mycotic pneumonia uh, in this young ruminant. Embolic, and the rest is sort of atelectic lung. This was a newborn, which makes me suspect that indeed it probably goes in utero infection. And in utero, mycotic infections in cattle are fairly common. If you're anywhere else in the United States, you'd probably say what first? Emphysema, sure. But if you're in Latin America, you better say uh, echinococcosis first, second, and third. Uh, these are kind of nice lesions, and they can be rather extensive throughout the lungs, uh, echinococcosis in the infestation. And if you cut one of those, uh, those little lesions open, uh, it's rather discreet. You find scoliosis on the inside, and the wall of it is made up of, there's very little reaction at any distance from the lesion, but right at the, e at the lesion edge, you'll find a nice le lineup of uh, multinucleated giant cells, a little bit of a fibrous capsule. But until they die, there's very little in the way of a granulomatous response, except for right at the very edge of the, the cyst. This is a classic lesion, uh, even though uh, we don't get it in the United States yet. Uh, there's a trachea from a goat, and typical plaque lesions on the surface that are the center of the plaque being depressed, very typical of a pock lesion. And uh, so this is goat pox, and uh, it's multifocal, proliferative, and necrotizing uh, tracheitis and goat pox. The question is here, which is big and which is small? We have either a very, very large uh, heart or a very, very small lung. And this is pulmonary hypoplasia. Uh, this is a, a, a newborn, and they're, I'm finding out many more, more and more every day. A number of virus diseases can do this. Oligohydramnion, of course, leads to pulmonary hypoplasia. So a virus that, that causes oligo oligohydramnion, like Cache Valley virus, uh, has the potential to do this. And indeed, in my experimental animals, I see this with some frequency. This was a spontaneous field case of uh, pulmonary hypoplasia. In a sheep, uh, this is, a bl I believe, a Barbary sheep, but it doesn't matter. We have the, the nose, the mouth, and a proliferative lesion up here, and also starting to compress up in the cribiform plate onto the uh, head, and I believe, next picture, no, I took it out. Uh, and it also will grow out and cause uh, proptosis of the eyes. And this is the adenocarcinoma of the, the nasal adenocarcinoma of sheep. This can occur in outbreaks, and indeed, a number of viruses have been isolated. Uh, but I don't believe it's been worked out totally that, so that everybody agrees on what virus causes it. But they've found retrovirus particles in there. They got, they've gotten an adenovirus out of it every once in a while. But uh, in, in some areas of the world, it comes in outbreaks. And in the United States, I'm only aware of sp sporadic cases, nasal adenocarcinoma of sheep. <coughs> Fibrinous tracheitis. I mean, the knee-jerk response, of course, should be a se severe diffuse fibrinous and fibrinopurulent, I should say, tracheitis and IBR, infectious bovine rhinotracheitis, tracheitis, bovine herpes virus 1. Uh, whenever I see it, though, I also want to suggest that you have another virus working in there, because often these animals will be positive for both IBR and bovine virus diarrhea virus. And of course, the story is, of course, that bovine virus diarrhea causes immune suppression. And I have nothing against that. I guess it can. It certainly infects lymphocytes. Um, this is the lungs from a goat. When I get to the end of the break period, I can't see the, the clock back there, and I, I do want to respect your break period, so just kind of yell out, break, and we'll do it. Uh, here's the lung of a, of a goat. Could be a sheep, for that matter. The same uh, species of worm caused it. These are the egg nests of the adult uh, stro uh, strongyl, metastrongyl that hits the hepatic parenchyma, uh, mullerus capillaris. Some people say it's protostrongus rufescens, but that's, you know, like you have Phileroides uh, oslii, Melxii, and Herthii in dogs. Well, this one is the one that takes up the place of Herthii, and oslii, and uh, probably more, more, more proper uh, Melxii take up the place of 
uh, Protostrongus. Protostrongus is in the airway still. This is in the parenchyma. So it's Mullerus in sheep and goats. Protostrongus is if it's in the small airways, but it doesn't make a nice gross lesion. And uh, if you have it inside the airways, we're dealing with Dictocolis like this. Uh, this is a cow, and we have the, the larger airway, lots of worms, Dictocolis, uh, viviparous, and uh, you, you went through those species already, I'm, I'm sure. This is an easy lesion to recognize. This is the anterior, I guarantee it's the anterior and ventral lobe of a, of a cow's lung. And you see a very coarsely nodular surface with a little bit of chronic pleuritis, at least a thickening of the pleura. Remembering that if you have an area of pleural thickening over the diaphragmatic lobe of, of uh, ruminants, that's a normal patch of thicken, uh, thickening of the pleura. It doesn't mean anything. But here, we have a little bit of thickening of the pleura. But that coarsely nodular pattern, and sometimes linear, is a dead giveaway for separative bronchiectasis. And when you cut through those, you have the lesions that are the dilated bronchi and bronchioles, and they're just full of uh, exudate mucus and exudate because of the mucociliary escalator has been destroyed. Uh, any number of bacteria could have started this, but in the chronic stage, uh, healing with atelectasis of the lung around uh, separate of bronchiectasis. Multifocal areas that you can't tell anything about from the outside. Uh, you're, you're not suspicious of a tumor probably because there doesn't seem to be a pattern of fibrosis associated with them. And when you cut through them, they look like this. And it looks a little bit like lymphoid tissue. And indeed, it has a lot of lymphoid tissue in it. But this is the classic appearance of granulomatous inflammation. In could be in the lung. It could be in the subcutaneous tissues, both caused by the same organisms, actinomyces bovis. And uh, if they're nice to you before they photograph it, they squeeze these a little bit. And you can squeeze a little bit of exudate uh, out of a lot of these little sinusoids. But these are sort of, they're not really firm and hard. Uh, but there's a lot of granulation tissue and a lot of fibrosis in it. And uh, this is just classic for granulation tissue inside uh, a lung. Looks just like a lymph node. In lungs of cattle, when you have areas of particularly uh, hemorrhage with fibrinous inflammation on the outside and a consolidation that seems sort of localized on cut section, very localized, and you can see the pattern of necrosis. Uh, Haemophilus comes to mind, Haemophilus pneumonia, particularly if it's in the diaphragmatic lung lobe. And uh, this doesn't necessarily kill. The bad ones kill. But uh, this animal has an area of uh, homophilus pneumonia, a large area affected oftentimes in the diaphragmatic lung lobe. The uh, lung of a cow. In the older days, we used to see it a lot more. Now if you, uh, I hear a beep, and we'll stop with this one, uh, you'd have a whole herd of cows and have large lesions like this. This is granulation tissue, but it's got a lot more fibrous tissue associated with it, and it's also granulomatous inflammation. This is tuberculosis. Uh, with the kinds of organisms we used to see uh, in the 60s and even the early 70s, and if you go to Latin America or other countries that have endemic tuberculosis, this is what you'd see. They really probably couldn't tell you that it's not acti, but uh, this happens to be a confirmed case of tuberculosis. And we'll stop with that. We'll give you a break. 15 minutes? 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Thank you.